Walk by faith, not by sight. We've been doing a series of lessons on Sunday nights about looking at some of the accounts in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, of saints walking by faith and some of the lessons that we can learn. Uh, tonight will be the last one that we do probably for a little while. The next, uh, sun, the next two Sunday nights, I'm going to do uh, two lessons kind of inspired by one of our Wednesday night uh, speakers. And next Sunday night, I want to look at the benefits of new Christians, of having new Christians in the church and what we can learn from them. And then the benefits uh, of having mature Christians. That doesn't necessarily mean older Christians, just mature in the faith Christians. And, and why we need, uh, um, you know, both in the church and the benefits that, that come with that. If you have your Bibles, open up to Acts 12. <clears throat> God had done this numerous times in the past. Think about the first time that God had done this. God sent two angels to Lot and his family in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah to rescue Lot and his family to urge them to get out before God destroyed these two cities by fire. Another time that God had exercised this uh, idea was that Abraham was stopped by an angel. As he has the knife raised in his hand before he brought the knife down to sacrifice his son Isaac, God sent an angel and said, Abraham, stop. And God provided a ram as a sacrifice. As Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were bound up and tossed into the furnace, God sent an angel and spared their lives because they were unwilling to compromise their faith and bow down to the golden uh, statue that Nebuchadnezzar had made. When Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, God sent an angel. And he closed the mouth of the lions to preserve um, Daniel's life because Daniel would not bow down and pray to any other king or so-called God except the one true God of heaven. And God sent an angel and spared him. God had done it several other times. God had sent an angel to warn Joseph of Her King Herod's intentions of searching out and finding the baby Jesus and putting him to death. And so God warned Joseph, take your son and your family and get away. The apostles had been preaching in the name of Jesus and they were arrested and thrown into prison. And guess what? God sent an angel and freed them. And the next day, the authorities find them standing again Preaching the gospel. Open your Bibles to Acts 12, verses 5 through 11, and let's read. Luke records this. <clears throat> now when Herod was about to bring him out, or excuse me, let's start in verse 5, that was verse 6. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. And I find this, to me, this is comical. The angel, he struck Peter on the side. It's like, whack, wake up, Peter. Like the bright light didn't do it. So the, the angel has to, you know, slap him around a little bit and says, wake up, Peter, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands and the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. So Peter, this whole time, thinks he's just kind of dreaming of what's <clears throat> taking place. 
And when he had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people uh, and all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, there were, um, and where, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And so they finally believe her and they open the door and, you know, there is Peter. I find it funny that she was so excited to hear Peter's voice. Instead of opening the door and letting him in, she runs in in her excitement and lets uh, those that were gathered there who had been praying for Peter to let them know that he was safe. Years later, Peter writes, perhaps even reflecting on his time in prison, maybe even thinking of specifically of this and a few other accounts in his life, he writes in 2 Peter 2 and verse 9, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. He had experienced that. And to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Peter writes, I'm, I'm convinced he writes from personal experience. Perhaps this very account and some others like it were running through his mind. And he says, I know God can spare the godly from trials. I've experienced that. And he knows the dramatic fashion, the impressive fashion in which God can do it. The angel appeared beside me, slapped me and said, wake up. Chains fall off. Gates open by itself. All of this thing, this happens. And, and then the angel vanishes. God, uh, Peter knows what God is able to do. Not only experiences it, but as a, a good uh, Jewish uh, man, he would have known all the other accounts that we just referenced of when God had sent his messengers, his angels, to save his people from trials. Now, let's look back <clears throat> at Acts, or Acts 12, verses 1 through 4. And let's read the account that sets the stage for Peter's dramatic uh, and impressive rescue uh, from prison. Back to Acts 12, 1 through 4. About that time, Herod, the king, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews... He proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, that is Peter, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. Luke records the death of James just quickly and so very matter-of-factly. Herod killed James the brother of John. That was it. That's all he says. Uh, and then he goes into this more, much longer, drawn out, dramatic rescue uh, of Peter from prison. That night, James sat in prison and no angel appeared. Why? I know the church was praying for James. They were praying for Peter. We're told that they were. I would imagine that the rest of the 12 were praying for their dear brother, that an angel would appear and be rescued. I would imagine that even James himself perhaps was praying, Father, you've done it before. Will you do it again? Spare my life. And the one that really gets to me is the fact that Jesus himself was interceding for James before the Father. Mm. Father, if it's your will, rescue him. He's done it before. Why didn't he do it this time? 
We've already referenced it, but I want you to look at uh, Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 17. <clears throat> 17 through 21. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. James would have been uh, one of those. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go. And stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and they began to teach. James knew that God could send an angel. James had been a part of this. James, matter of fact, he had seen God. Now he not only had known about all the Old Testament times that God had sent an angel, James had been part of a group of men arrested, put in prison, who had been arrest, or been saved and rescued by an angel before. He knew that it could happen. He had seen it happen before. He was part of that group who had been rescued from prison. He had seen God do it. But this night... Acts 12, 1 through 4, James sat in prison, praying, and no angel appeared. There was no bright light. The doors didn't just open up by themselves. The chains didn't fall off his hands and perhaps his his feet. No miracles took place. Just James in a prison cell. Prayers. The next morning, James was still in prison. At some point, I'm sure James heard the dreaded words, it's time, go get the prisoner. And the guards show up and they unlock the, uh, the cell and, and they walk in and they grab James. They begin to, to escort him to the place of, of his execution where he would breathe his last breath. I would even imagine at some point James was given a second chance. James, you can live. Just renounce your Jesus. Hmm. I imagine if he heard those words, the words of his Savior rang in his ear. Those who confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father in heaven. But those who deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father in heaven. Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33. I imagine the words of even uh, uh, Matthew records, Matthew 10 and verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. I guess that even other words that he had heard Jesus say, uh, you know, went through his mind and through his ears. But no angel appeared that day. The sword was lifted. The sword came down. And James lost his life. There was no rescue that day. Or was there? I would would submit to you that God did rescue James. James' brother... Many years later, as he receives the revelation from Jesus Christ, he would write these words to the church at Smyrna. He would say, Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Hmm. Think about what happened to his brother as John is writing these words. You think uh, memories of his brother sitting in prison would have come to his head. Think about that. But behold, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. That's what happened to his brother. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. But be faithful. Be faithful unto death. That doesn't mean be faithful all of your days until you die. What Jesus is saying there is be faithful even if it requires you to die. And I will give you the crown of life. As he's writing these words and 
He keeps receiving uh, this revelation in chapter 14 and verse 13. He writes these things. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. It's interesting to me that James's death is what led to Peter's arrest and then his subsequent miraculous release from prison. Think about that. When James was killed, Herod saw that excited the people, and so he goes and arrests Peter. I would assume, guessing that he had planned to do the same thing with Peter and have him put to death, but God miraculously sends an angel and delivers Peter out of prison. Why does God allow James to die? But perhaps even the next few days later, rescues Peter from prison. I can't answer that question. I wish I could. I have, a, I have an idea. I may run it by you after a while. But uh, I, I, can't, I can't tell you that reason. And I, and I think that if we sit there and think about that too much, we might really lose uh, the point of, of, or the lesson that we can learn from this uh, account. And I think the lesson that we learn is this. Matthew 10 and verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. When we walk by faith, we do not fear what the world can do to us. Now, I'm not so naive to think that we won't experience fear or concern or that there may not be times when we're really afraid for our lives. Those that, that may happen from time to time. But when we walk by faith, we walk by faith, we do not fear what the world can do to us. Look at Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> I think Mark chapter 4 was an account that, that we studied our very first uh, lesson in this series of lessons. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to the end of the chapter. On that day when the evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. This is Jesus talking to the twelve. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the winds were breaking into uh, the boat, so that the boat was already filling. So that the winds were blowing, and the waves were crashing in. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea. And he said to them, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said, and that's the idea of, of awe, and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The winds were blowing, they were creating waves, and, and the waves were crashing <clears throat> into the boat so that the boat was beginning to fill with water. And if you're out in the middle of the sea and that happens, the first thing that goes through your mind as, as a fisherman is, we're going to sink. And if this boat sinks, we have nowhere to go. We're out in the middle of the sea, we have to swim or we have to hold on. But the first thought is, we're going to drown. They're scared, they're afraid. And they go to Jesus and they, they, they basically kind of accuse him. Do you not care that we are about to die? And Jesus stands up, he looks out and says, stop. And it stops. And they're in awe. And he looks at them and says, do you not have faith? Do you not have faith? I think what Jesus is, is trying to tell them and show to us that there are other things in life that you need to be concerned about. And perhaps death isn't one of them. We're so afraid of death, aren't we? The unknown, as we, we term it or we think about it. But why are we afraid of it? Peter, I think Jesus is telling the other 12, there's going to be so many other things that you need to be concerned with. There's going to be so many other things that you're going to face as one of my followers, especially one of the 12, as I send you out into the world to teach the gospel. There are going to be times when you're really going to be faced with death. What are you going to do about it? 
Are you going to cower in fear? Are you going to be worried about it? Or are you going to stand up with boldness and courage and you're going to teach the gospel and proclaim me as Lord and Savior? What are you going to do? Jesus says, we walk by faith. We're not going to fear what the world can do to us. Hasn't happened yet, but it might. I might reach a point in my life where I face death because of my faith. My kids may face that. My grandkids are way in the future. But they, who knows? Who knows what kind of uh, hostility the world will show Christianity in, in, in a number of years from now. I'm not even going to guess. A number of years from now. And we may stand in fear. We may be faced with our death. Are we going to worry about what the world can do with us? Are we going to be concerned with Jesus and what he's done for us? What will go through our minds? We may be tempted to, to, to cry out to God, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we're about to die? And I want you to know that he does. He does. We're told in John chapter 11 that a very good friend of Jesus dies. Lazarus dies. And even though Jesus knows that he's going to raise him from the dead, what does Jesus do? The shortest verse in the Bible. We all got it memorized. Jesus wept. Does he care? Yeah. He cares. He cares about his people. He loves us as his people. And he cares when it's time for our death. I think he cares. And is concerned about that. But he wants us to walk by faith and not fear what the world can do to us. It's Jesus, before he experienced his own death, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. <clears throat> and he prays, Father, if there's any other way, I'm paraphrasing it, but he says, if there's any other way, let's do it that way. Why? I don't, I'm not sure that Jesus wanted to die. I, I, I think there was a concern, a little bit of a concern there. He doesn't want to die. But how does he finish the prayer? Not my will but your will be done. If this is it, if this is the way that it has to be done, then we'll go through with this because this is your plan, this is your will, and I know what it will bring about. He wasn't concerned with what the world could do with him. John Bloom wrote this about James. James was not being neglected by God. As, as James sits in the prison and he's praying and the, the eleven are praying and the church is praying and Jesus is in, even interceding uh, for him at the right hand of God, John Bloom writes this, James was not being neglected by God. <clears throat> he was, in fact, the first to experience what Jesus prayed for in John 17 and verse 24, where Jesus prays, Father... I desire that they also, he's speaking of the eleven, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before for the foundation of the world. God prayed, Jesus prayed, I want them to be with me. I want them to see my glory. And James was the first one to experience that. Well, I guess... Perhaps Stephen was, uh, but James, first of, of the twelve, I guess. James walked by faith. He trusted Jesus as the resurrection and the life. And Jesus says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. What a beautiful statement. Jesus isn't promising that we won't experience physical death. But that physical death is really us being ushered into eternal life. How beautiful it is. James is among those in Hebrews chapter 11 where the Hebrew writer says this in verse 35, some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. When we walk by faith, we do not fear what the world can do to us. Because when we leave this life, we rise to 
a better life. When we walk by faith, we do not fear what the world can do to us. But I want you to know the opposite of that is true as well. When we walk by sight, we fear all the wrong things. we walk by sight, we fear all the wrong things. You know, God often has different priorities than us. Do you agree with that? The things that we think are important, a lot of times the things that I believe are urgent, isn't what God always thinks is important. And it isn't always what God thinks is urgent. God's priorities a lot of times are different than ours. And perhaps, I don't know this, and I can't prove this, but perhaps the greater priority in the death of James was not dramatically rescuing James, but allowing James' profession of faith to dramatically affect those that witnessed his execution. Think about it. Some, witnessing someone who's willing to die for their faith. How powerful of a witness is that? When we walk by faith, we do not fear what the world can do to us. All of us here tonight are in different places in our walk with God. Some of us are new Christians. Some of us have been followers of Jesus for a long, long time. And I'm so thankful for that. And some of us, maybe a lot of us, are sprinkled within the mix there. <clears throat> not really considered new Christians. Maybe not really consider ourselves mature Christians. We're all on different spectrums of our walk of faith. But I hope, wherever you find yourself, that you have your eyes fixed on Jesus, you're looking to Him, and you're laying aside everything that uh, the the Hebrew writer says, the weight and the sin. We read this one that clings so closely, and we're looking to Him, the author and the finisher of our faith. And we're walking by faith, and we're not, we do not fear what the world can do to us. Maybe you feel your faith faltering. Maybe you're doubting a little bit. It's okay to doubt. Thomas did it. But in your doubts, search for answers. Don't just have doubts and walk away. If you have doubts, search for answers. Open up God's Word. Come to to someone else that you trust in the faith and ask them questions so that we can open up God's Word and we can study with you and we can build your faith and strengthen your faith so that you will walk by faith and not by sight. Maybe tonight you're ready. You've been reading about Jesus. You've been asking questions. You've been studying about Him. You've been reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You've been reading through the book of Acts. You've been reading what Paul has been writing to churches. And you're ready to put your faith in the finished work of Jesus. You're ready to cause heaven to rejoice. You can do that tonight by repenting of your sins, being immersed into Jesus for forgiveness of those sins, raised to walk in new life as a child of God, as a member of His family. And together, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. Whatever your need is, please come forward while we stand and while we sing.